Hello, and welcome to the Block Solid Podcast, where we talk about the blockchain and the evolution of the property market, the newest technologies that enhance and revolutionize the world of real estate as we know it, and how we, the owners, the buyers, the renters, the investors, the entrepreneurs, and the academics, and the researchers can benefit from it all. I'm Yael Tamar, CEO and co-founder of Solid Block, a pioneer startup in real estate tokenization, and I'd like to welcome my friend, Dr. Jane Thomason, social entrepreneur, social impact thought leader, and blockchain prominent who believes in creating social change with blockchain. Hi, Jane. How are you? Hi, I'm great. So good to join you. Thank you so much for coming. I have so much to ask you. I'm so curious, and I think we can learn a lot from you and your experience in this blockchain for good space. And everybody's curious also about the role of crypto in social change, the role of blockchain in general, how it's changed in the last 10 to, I guess, 12, 13 years and how it will continue to change. And of course, you are one of the best people I thought to talk about this. So let's get started. Sure. Looking forward to talking with you. So Jane, tell me a little bit about how you got into the blockchain space. I believe there's a story there. There's always a story. Well, I spent most of my life working in developing countries, mainly in healthcare. And so I had a really good understanding of some of the challenges that they face around remoteness, isolation, lack of personnel, inability to send money and all sorts of things like that. And in fact, my son told me in 2010 to buy Bitcoin. No, I didn't do that. Or I probably wouldn't be on this podcast. But anyway, then he came in 2016 when the price had gone up quite substantially. And he said, Mom, did you buy Bitcoin when I told you to? And I said, no. And he said, well, I think by then it was like over $1,000. He said, now, let me tell you this. Bitcoin is built on blockchain and that's going to change everything and you need to learn about blockchain. So really, that's I had no technology background before then. And so I started trying to understand it and learn about it. And it was very difficult because it's counterintuitive. It took me a long time to understand why it was important to me. And then I kind of had an epiphany thinking about a humanitarian setting. And I was thinking about the tsunami in Banda Aceh in Indonesia. And I realised sort of at that moment that it wasn't just that people were washed to sea. No one knew who they were. No one knew who the survivors were. No one knew who was in the hospitals because all the identities were gone. The land records were gone. The health records were gone. Wow. Yeah. And I just had this moment. I went, oh, my God, you know, if we can get this operating at scale for humanitarian emergencies, that was my first thought, then this could have really not changed the outcome in terms of people lost, but could have changed the reconstruction so much. And so I just went, I have to really understand this. So we actually took a delegation from to my first blockchain conference in 2017 with a delegation from the Central Bank of Papua New Guinea, because that's a country which has 85% of the population don't have bank accounts and wow. very, very low. And so it's sort of like, How can blockchain help with financial inclusion? And we sponsored the hackathon at the London Blockchain Week to help think about this problem of financial inclusion in PNG. So it just sort of rolled on from there. And I learned such a lot at that hackathon. At the conference, no one was talking about social impact. There was ICO days and everyone was getting excited about tokens. But, you know, slowly but surely, I've continued to follow this. I've continued to support companies that are working on these projects. I've spoken about it. I've written about it. And now we really have a movement around blockchain for sustainability and social impact. So it's really, you know, snowballed from those very early days when very few people were thinking about it. Wow, that is such a great story. And I'm just wondering how blockchain is going to help a sleep fraud, right? So obviously into the banking, in the banking space, financial and remittance payments that have been crucial for people all around the world that don't have access to regular financial services. And I'm sure there are other applications of blockchain social change, and we're going to talk about them. What is the best kind of application that you have seen so far that had the biggest impact on people's well-being? Well, I don't know that I can talk in that way. But what I want to talk to you about is, first of all, what we've seen in terms of adoption. 
And if you have a look at Chain Analysis work or We Are Social, who's looking at adoption of crypto, the top 20 countries in the world are nearly all emerging economies because it's solving that problem of the unbanked and people trying to get money to each other. So it's not US, Europe or Australia. It's emerging economies that are really embracing this because it's helping them. The second thing I wanted to say is, We need to look at what happened to blockchain during the pandemic because I think there's a few important things that happened. One was that people couldn't send money through banks and through mobile money providers and so forth. And if they needed to send remittances or foreign exchange, they started using some of the blockchain companies that did remittances. Or, you know, if they needed... I love the story in the Philippines of the people who do Netflix and Spotify And then they were using the blockchain remittance providers to get small amounts of foreign exchange so they could buy their Netflix cards and keep on selling them. And so we saw a lot of innovation in terms of mobile money and financial inclusion during the pandemic. But we also saw movement in terms of healthcare. And healthcare was a very resistant industry, but suddenly people needed to share healthcare data. And so they started using blockchains to underpin some of the secure data sharing. And if you remember those red maps that we all watched at the beginning of the pandemic, from that was all underpinned by a blockchain platform. And then similarly, when we started having problems with the provenance of PPE equipment and fake PPE equipment, people started using blockchain in the supply chains to make sure that equipment was sound and and from the appropriate manufacturers. So there were so many innovations that took place in response to the pandemic. But I think the other thing that's kind of amazing about the pandemic is no one went out. So all the developers and all the people who were building stuff, they didn't go out to parties because they couldn't. And so they really started building. So that's when we saw, first of all, the explosion of DeFi, because if you think about it in 2019, You'd heard the term DeFi, but no one really knew what it was and no one could really cite projects. And suddenly people were building these DeFi protocols. And then after DeFi came the NFT phase. So everyone was producing NFTs and then play to earn games was huge during the pandemic. And what we learned was they were actually giving people in developing countries, particularly the Philippines, the opportunity to earn enough money to put food on the table of their families from playing Axie Infinity. So a lot of these things were born out of necessity or the pressure of the pandemic. We saw so much innovation taking place during the pandemic, especially in DeFi and NFTs and play to earn games. Wow, it accelerated everything, didn't it? Yeah, Yeah. and I can clearly see in response to all kinds of crises, like the pandemic or the war in Ukraine, you have crypto as the only payment method right now in many of the areas where you know money can't get in. In these areas, of course, crypto prices can be even higher, right? And in Russia right now, I think they had an explosion in purchase of wallets, right? Of hardware wallets of about 600% this year, right? So because people are afraid of what's going to happen with their money, especially when they don't trust the government. So we can clearly see how these catastrophic events, right, can give birth to new technologies. And another thing that you said about, you know, the catastrophe in the Philippines and the tsunami that erased not only lives, but you didn't know who was still alive and who was not. And I was thinking about something that my friend who co-founded Banker said recently in a panel with me, he said that the blockchain is going to be bigger than the internet because the internet is the way to transmit information from one place to the other. And the blockchain is the way to transmit information across time. And the blockchain is the way to transmit value. So I see the blockchain as being an essential underpinning of everything that's being built at the moment, moving towards Web3 and the metaverse. It's not going to be separate, but it's going to be an integral part of all of these things because it's now provided us a way to be able to transfer value. And that's why people are calling it the next iteration of the internet. And blockchain is absolutely central to that. And you said something very interesting. Everybody was at home for two years And that gave rise to a lot of new technologies. Is the metaverse one of those technologies? 
Well, it's interesting what's happened with the metaverse because the metaverse is really a combination of a lot of different technologies. People have been developing the computing power. People have been developing, you know, the various infrastructure to be able to view in 3D. The game people were developing their hyper-realistic games and then the blockchain people were, they were doing their NFTs and DeFi and all of these things. And then I think, you know, people started to see this whole idea of Web3 and the transfer of value and an immersive Web3, which is the metaverse. And that was all bubbling along, but it wasn't yet famous. So it hadn't kind of come to notoriety. So I think that really Mark Zuckerberg getting up and making that big announcement about building a metaverse for Facebook and calling Facebook meta, I think that brought it to real public prominence and then started what we have now, which is, you know, a real flurry of people who are trying to build these metaverses. So you've got, last time I looked, more than 160 companies and entities are building metaverses. So they're all around the place, but it's incredibly exciting because it's this exploration of the future that we don't totally understand what it is yet. So Web3 in the metaverse is not a thing yet. It's kind of like a future concept that we know we're moving towards. So all of these different companies are approaching it in different ways for different industries and for different purposes. So it's an enormously exciting time. Yeah, I think it's a FOMO in a way, right? It's fear of missing out because a lot of people missed out on you know Web2 emerging and building opportunities on it created many of today's billionaires, right? And then you had Bitcoin emerging and that created a wave of billionaires, right? So people are trying to spot these trends before, right, ahead of time to be able to capitalize. And then I wonder really what's going to be the biggest thing in Web3? Is it the metaverse? Is it the ability to interact in VR or AR or, you know, the way to add AI and blockchain to these virtual worlds? Do you have any idea? And in general, let's just talk about what is Web3? So I think the metaverse is an immersive Web3. It's an immersive internet. Web3 is the one that allows the exchange of value in a way that we, before we could only send in information, now we can exchange value. And it, it has all the kind of components of the metaverse, but the metaverse is, is immersive. But I think there's just a couple of points to be made here, you know, in terms of what's going on. So the first divide is that you have the open and closed metaverses. So the closed metaverse, are what all the big techs are doing, what Facebook is doing, because they're going to try and build a proprietary metaverse and they're going to continue to try and extract information, data and money from you. Whereas the Web3 community is very much more of the blockchain ethos, peer-to-peer, -peer, community ownership, community benefit and open and transparent exchange of value. So there's a bit of a divide there. But then what we're seeing is that as people are trying to look at different problems, so whether it's entertainment, socialising, commerce, healthcare, real estate, all of these different areas, people are looking at how they can address them with a metaverse in different ways. So you have places like Decentraland where everyone can go in. You can open a real estate place, you can you know, build a building, you can have your healthcare, you can sell your designer clothes. But others are trying to build things that are just, let's say, for healthcare, a metaverse that is really about expanding and enabling healthcare with the tools that are available in the metaverse. So they're very different. And some people, they're just building really cool metaverse games, which is okay too. And several governments now, so you've got Saudi Arabia, you've got UAE, you have Korea, Seoul in South Korea, they're saying, right, we're putting our government services in the metaverse in Seoul. So if you come to get services from the government, you're going in the metaverse. You don't have to get in your car and drive down to the city office. We're going to provide that all to you, you know, through your device. So there's so many different things going on at the moment and everyone's trying. Citibank did a report a few months ago and they're saying it's a $13 trillion opportunity by 2030. So big numbers and there are others who are quoting, you know, similarly big numbers. So lots of investment going in, lots of hope that this is really going to be able to enhance and solve some of our problems and, you know, make our lives better in many ways. There's, the jury's out. We don't know. 
But that's what people are speculating on. I love it. $13 trillion is a big industry, right? So we definitely have to, as entrepreneurs, identify in which direction we should be going. And, you know, especially solid block when we're dealing with real estate and we see so many applications of real estate tokenization on the metaverse, but not quite in kind of the purchase of the land where most of it has gone so far with the NFTs, but more as an opportunity to maybe to explore different things to buy or different ways to live or different ways to visit holidays or hotel reservations and gamifying it all. Like for me, it's uh, a lot of it is about gamification, right? So what do you think is the role of the metaverse or would it, it play actually in social change? Can you give us some examples of anything that's happening so far or maybe something that you predict will happen with that technology specifically? Well, I think it's really interesting that you asked that question. And and this is only hearsay, but it makes sense to me. So I was talking to someone about the metaverse that they're building at Neon in Saudi Arabia, which is this special economic zone. And as I understand it, they're spending a billion dollars on building the metaverse. But one of the things that they want to use it for is actually around creating a safe space for social change. Because as you know, the king of Saudi Arabia has announced that he wants to open up Saudi Arabia and he wants, you know, women now are allowed to be free and drive cars and do different things. But that kind of social change doesn't come quickly. So one of the things I understand they want to do in NEOM is kind of create an environment where in a safe and somewhat guided way, people can experience life outside of the reasonably closed environment that had been there before. And I think that's tremendously interesting. And it just makes you then think about if you want to create purposeful social change, how you might use a medium like that to do it. So that's the sort of purposeful social change. I I think the other part of it is the unintended social change. And that's probably where I talk quite a lot and I think about and I write about ethical issues in a digital age, but think about what are the ethical issues. Didn't you, Jane? Yeah, we did a book last year on applied ethics in a digital world with Dr. Ingrid Vassilou Feltes. And it really looked at a number of these questions and including, I did a chapter on blockchain, so feel free to go and have a look at it. But all of these, all of the different aspects are throwing up ethical questions, some of which we have encountered before, some of which we have not encountered before. But the key about digital ethics is it can scale so quickly and impact on so many people so quickly that a single algorithm, for example, making a decision about whether someone gets a loan or not, can affect millions of people or can be biased against certain social groups. So it's really important to think about ethics in a digital world because it can scale so quickly and impact on so many people's lives and could be in a negative way. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one thing I think that metaverse will allow us to do is test things properly, right? A lot of times companies and governments test their technologies in the real world, and there's all these unintended consequences. We can have this environment where we can test things safely and see the impact. Maybe there will be less wars and less catastrophic, you know, environmental impact, stuff like that, right? So, and so I think certainly around healthcare, for example, you know, people can test new operational operations, surgical procedures, people can test new physical hospitals and the way patient flow and the way things are managed by using digital twins. And of course, the beauty of the metaverse is it's always on. So traditionally, say in healthcare, the way global collaboration took place is 50 people would get on a plane and fly from everywhere in the world to New York or Geneva or London, spend three or four days together, and then get on a plane and go home. Whereas metaverse you can be talking and meeting and collaborating continuously without that need for travel. So, you know, there are some real opportunities. And then when you put that together with digital twins of whatever it is you're working on, you have a collaboration space. You don't need a big building. You don't need lots of meeting rooms. And people can come into this virtual environment. And I think it should improve global collaboration around building things and problem solving. 
That is such a great point about the global collaboration, right? If some governments don't talk to each other. Saudi Arabia didn't used to talk to Israel, for example, and now there are some rumors about, you know, reviving the relationship and building social and business ties. Uh, but maybe these things could happen in the metaverse, right? People that are super isolated in many places of the world. And I think are- even, uh, you know, if you think about mental health and social isolation, this is a place where I think that there's a real opportunity. So perhaps you're old, perhaps you're disabled, perhaps you have xenophobia or something like this. And this enables you to go into different worlds, meet people, socialise. As you said, take a trip to ancient Mesopotamia or wherever it is that you wanted to go and be as if you were there. So I think it creates a lot of opportunity for socially isolated old and disabled people as well. Wow, absolutely. And your second book was called Applied Ethics in a Digital World. Your first book was blockchain technologies for global social change. And now you're writing a third book on Web3. Is that right? The wonderful world of Web3 coming soon. I'm really looking forward to it. I think that a lot of people in the world heard about Web3, but are not 100% sure about what it is, what its place is in relation to blockchain, crypto, metaverse. It's kind of a cloud right now of different terms, right? And we need a concrete explanation of what it is and what to expect, right? And and how it will change our lives or our businesses. I'm hoping that the audience here will take a look and help us all understand it better. And now you're writing a book about Web3, right? What is it called? The Wonderful World of Web3. Amazing. So I'm really wondering what it is about Web3 that we all need to pay attention to, right, as entrepreneurs or as technology builders. So can you speak to us about that? I really think that we don't know yet just how influential it will be on the world. But I think we're at that Steve Jobs moment when he stood there imagining a future that didn't exist, which was a computer in the palm of your hand, and he created the iPhone. And I think we're at the moment of having this constellation of technologies that are going to enable us to do so many different things. And there's only a few really kind of creative thinkers who can put it together and imagine what that might be in our future world. So what I'm hoping to achieve with the book is, you know, maybe for the less creative thinkers, just what is the history? Why is this happening? What are the basic building blocks And then what might that do in sectors like healthcare or real estate or entertainment or travel and so forth, and then make it real for people? Because most people still think it's a game there someplace. And the one I'd love to tell, and every woman in the world resonates with this, no one likes going to the department store and buying underwear or swimming costumes. No woman in the world. And you're going to be able to send your perfectly proportioned avatar who is exactly attuned to your body measurements into a virtual store, try on underwear and swimming costumes, select exactly what you want, and then order it right there and then and get it delivered to your home. I mean, how good is that? (laughs) I love it. I use it for everything. (laughs) Try everything. Well, exactly. And so it's like it's trying to help people go, oh, how might this help me with this thing that I need to do? And I guess I'm just trying to be a bridge and make it real and and help it resonate with people so they go, oh, okay, I get it now. I can see how that might work. I love it. Let's talk for a minute about the evolution of crypto because, you know, we started with Bitcoin, continued with a few other popular currencies, altcoin, you know, a few ICOs with utility tokens, the NFTs, and so on and so forth, right? I'd love to hear your thoughts about how the role of crypto might change with the advent of CBDCs, the central bank digital currencies that do solve some of the issues that people have with fiat currencies, but of course create a few more issues. So I'd love to hear about your opinion on that and how that is related to social change. I think a lot of, well, we probably need to go back and say, We have blockchain, which is the underpinning platform that all of these things are built on. You have what people are calling cryptocurrencies, but other people call them digital assets, which are built on top of blockchains. The two 
best known and oldest, of course, are Bitcoin and Ethereum. But there are many more competitor blockchains coming up. And we have the crypto, if you like, that has a utility and then the ones that are purely speculative. So there's probably 10 or more different kinds of tokens that ultimately people need to understand. So we're not talking about one thing. But having said that, with the central bank digital currencies, these are things that many central banks are going to explore. But I think they're going to be more along the lines of digitised fiat currency rather than something completely different, which is, I think, what a number of the different blockchain projects are trying to achieve. And then in addition, you have the risks, which people are already talking about, is the ability for governments to increase surveillance using CBDCs because they can see exactly what you're spending your money on. And not everyone is going to want that as much. And potentially they could persecute groups that you know, weren't popular. So you've kind of got that whole CBDC thing. I think the other big comment to be made is China being first with the digital yuan, but the potential that they may push that out and try and compete with the US dollar as the dominant global currency because they have more than 110 countries on their Belt and Road Initiative. And if they started insisting that this CBDC digital yuan be used there, you're going to change the sort of balance in the global monetary system. But then on the other side, you've also got, you know, various people in the crypto community building things that have utility that people want to use, they feel safe with, like stable coins, for example, notwithstanding what happened about a month ago. And I think that it's going to provide a completely different purpose. And then you need to mention in the same breath the big techs who are also all going into financial services. And so Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon, they're all going into financial services and they're going to create a new form of competition because they always have these huge customer bases already in the millions and some billions that they can then offer different services to. So I think we're moving into a period of some destabilisation of the global monetary system But I think blockchain people who are building platforms that have real utility, that can build big communities who support them and are building on their platforms, and that's why Ethereum is still the leader because they were the first. But you've got a lot of, if you like, Ethereum competitor platforms coming up. Then I think that what we're going to see is just a continuation of all of these people building and those platforms that attract the most developers and the most communities to them will in the long run be the most popular. And I don't think CBDCs will be relevant to that because it's almost a different function that these platforms will be performing. Absolutely. And CBDCs, I guess, is just an improvement of the way the fiat currencies operate. And maybe you don't need to have very complicated economic instruments to influence the value of money where you just basically have an electronic way to establish where you want the money to go and how you want it to be priced in order to stimulate the economy, right? Is that something that is being talked about in research and academia, about the change of economic policymaking or tools to do that? Oh, yeah. No, I think a lot of people are doing research into that. And, you know, different people have different views. There's uh, great book called DeFi and the Future of Finance by Professor Cam Harvey from Duke University. And he's basically hypothesizing or that central banks won't be needed in the long term with DeFi and that retail banks are going to have to significantly reform their business models or they're going to go out of business as well. So, I mean, he's probably on the really out there on the edge extent, but I think there are many people just speculating how this whole thing is going to unfold. And I don't think any of us know yet. Wow. And what is your opinion on DeFi? And what is it really? When people talk about DeFi, they mean a lot of different things. If you could unpack a little bit what DeFi is and where it's come to and what is happening today in the context of, is it helpful that we learned that you shouldn't be using crypto as a base, you know, as a collateral for loans without kind of this risk management, what we've seen helping with Celsius and many other digital banks that have failed. 
and how is that going to influence the DeFi space moving forward? So there's a few issues around DeFi. So the first thing is what is DeFi? Basically, it's anything that centralised finance institutions do, lending, borrowing, staking, trading, but in a decentralised manner. So that means you can do it peer-to-peer. So that's the first thing. The second thing, and this is why DeFi was able to grow so quickly, is because of the open source nature of blockchain, people were able to find a DeFi protocol that had already been built by someone else, take it and then build a few other things on the top of it and launch it really quickly. And when I'm saying really quickly, it could be in a matter of days or weeks. And so people often call it like the Lego because you can just take pieces from here and there and plug them together because it's all open source. And so that's kind of exciting and it allowed people to sort of launch these products super quickly, but not necessarily safe in terms of investors' assets. And I think that this is one of the risks that people have been speaking about with DeFi is how do you know whether it's safe to invest in a particular DeFi project or not? Because the only way you could know is if you had someone who was really expert and could audit the code and tell you there's no vulnerabilities in the code and there's very few people who can do that. So people made a lot of risks, a lot of returns, but there's also risks. And, you know, Celsius was an example, Luna, you know, of when things go wrong, what can happen? So I think the DeFi market's got to mature. Regulators will get involved. It doesn't matter whether we think they should or not. They have to figure out how they're going to get involved. And, for example, it's been suggested that, you know, regulators might actually run a node in a DAO as a way of being able to track what's going on in the DAO. So, look, I think that there's a lot of growth and maturing it to go in the DeFi market. And we all get excited about DAOs, these decentralised autonomous organisations. But there's a lot of research going on at the moment, which is clearly showing a lot of them are not that decentralised and not parts of them are autonomous, but parts of them aren't autonomous. So that whole issue about DAO governance is a very topical issue that people are trying to work on to figure out how to do it better but in the long run that aside in every it's like in the ICO boom there were lots of people who did crazy things and then they disappeared when the slump came and I think that what we're going to see in this slump is the people who are serious will keep on building the people who were just in it for the you know quick wins they'll disappear and I think the space will come improve as a result of this current market conditions, to be honest with you, because only the serious will continue. Yeah, wow, I understand. So yeah, Jane, this was super, super interesting. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Just one last question, or if you want to, you know, share anything else that I didn't ask you, you know, feel free as well. But I'm really wondering, where do you see yourself in five years? I just don't know. No, I was laughing because I was going... Okay, I'm glad I've got five years. I'm going to make the most of it. It's really, it's that bridge. It's that bridge between the old world and the new world and helping people understand and, you know, shining a light on the projects that are doing the great work and just being a go-to place for people who want to know about blockchain, metaverse, DeFi, that's credible and trusted. I think that that's where I can play a role. I love that. I love talking to you, Jan. I always learn so much. I really appreciate the time you spent with us. For everyone listening, thank you for joining us on the Block Solid podcast. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or by visiting our website at solidblog.co slash podcast. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to rate and review and spread the word. And last thing, Jane, do you have a website or social media accounts that you want people to tune into? I think just follow me on LinkedIn. I post most things that I do on LinkedIn. I do have a website, but I'm not that diligent. So follow me on LinkedIn. Fantastic. All right. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Thank you so much.